Welcome back to another episode of Lab Notes, where we dig into some of the 3D printing news and info that surrounds our own personal 3D printing labs. And I'll try to have links for everything in the description. Now, I've personally had knee and back problems for a number of years, and jumping out of airplanes is a lot of fun and until you hit the ground on some of those. But um, when I saw these articles, I thought they were extremely interesting and of course 3D printing related. There's a Dr. Michael J. Hurst in West Virginia and he performed their very first surgery that uses a custom 3D printed navicular bone implant and that's going to relate to a complex foot injury. Now it's 3D printed, so I was very interested in how this would work. They created it in partnership with a company, Restore 3D, uh, utilizing advanced 3D printing technology. But here's the neat thing, to match the patient's unique anatomy. So they're not just like making these and throwing them in whoever, they're physically and however they're doing scanning and making sure that every 3D print is perfectly matched to that person's foot, the way it was before they replaced it. I can see this as a definite plus. If they're able to do this for a bone in your foot, now that carries all the weight of your body. If it's going to be something that will last and something that's going to make things better, I can see that translating to every other part of your body. And then I saw this next article. Researchers at the University of Manchester. Well, they've developed a method to bioprint functional human spinal discs. So if you have a back problem, like I do, then this could be a really good thing. It could get you fixed up a lot quicker. And it says they're aiming to revolutionize back pain treatment. They're using collagen and alginate gels. <laughs> so we're not using that at home, not yet. Uh, insights from this research could lead to new regenerative therapies for back pain, which they say affects over 600 million people worldwide. And I'm definitely one of those because that's the problem I have is a lower disc problem. So now imagine how this type of medical 3D printing could translate to our own home 3D printing labs. Now, we're not going to be printing with complex alginate and collagen, but here's the thing. Could this relate to food safe? Because if they're putting it in your body, it's going to have to be something that's not going to be rejected by your body, and it's going to have to be something that's not absorbing things. So... I just really see this as a great step for us to be able to have a material, some, hopefully something easy to print like PLA or PETG, that could be food safe and we don't have to worry about it and stress over whether or not this print is going to hold in bacteria and mold and stuff like that. I think this is a plus. Anytime we see something like this, not just for people like me with back problems and all of that, but that's how I see this translating, food safe material. And I'm all for getting rid of the back pain, but can you imagine 3D printing with a gelatin mix of alginate and collagen? Yeah, you definitely don't want to mix that up with your jello in your fridge. There's always room for jello. <laughs> Our new Secretary of Defense put out a memo recently that, among a lot of other things, set in place that the military should have the right to repair, especially in the field. Now, before this, they had to get all of their repair items direct from the manufacturer. And if you can imagine a Humvee in the field, whether it's a war zone or whatever it is, something breaks, you've got to contact the manufacturer back in America or wherever else they are, get those parts shipped over, and at the very worst, they have a whole stockpile of them, which is just crazy to think about. And not to mention, this might stop a lot of those jokes about $1,000 screwdrivers and hammers and things. Bidding $10,000 for that? $10,000. $50,000. He created the U.S. Army's Battle Damage Repair and Fab Fabrication Program, BDRF. 
and it's going to create temporary parts for vehicles when original parts are hard to get or in the case of a lot in the military when they keep things it'll replace parts that could possibly be obsolete so how are they going to make those parts in the field well obviously 3d printing and they're going to quickly replace damaged vehicle parts and that'll reduce downtime and make it a lot safer for our guys and women out there in the field doing everything that they do. Um, right now, they have over 600 parts that have been modeled and produced, uh, keeping those vehicles and other things operational in the field. Now, here's the most important part for me. Some of those 3D printed parts that they're making out there, they've performed better than the original parts the manufacturers have supplied for replacements. And they're actually talking about making these 3D printed parts permanent. Whether you're using 3D printing in a combat zone, outer space, or building a house, any advances should hopefully for us mean a lot better 3D printing at home. Um, and maybe that could fix things for us to make it easier to print things like that are made out of ABS and possibly even metal filaments, maybe. Well, since I mentioned 3D printing in outer space, NASA has a new thing that they're doing. They are testing 3D printing with simulated lunar regolith. Now, I kind of knew what that word was. I looked it up, make sure, and that's moon dirt, regolith. And they're using the simulated uh, lunar dirt to develop construction methods for the moon and Mars. The project, which is led by NASA's Moon to Mars Planetary Autonomous Construction Technology, MMPACT, or MPACT, they love their acronyms. That program focuses on using that lunar dirt as the primary construction material. Now, utilizing things like that regolith, their goal is to reduce the need to transport that material back and forth from Earth. And it could enable, as they say, the construction of habitats and infrastructure directly on the lunar surface. And it'll make it so much easier. They just gather up the dirt, put together whatever bonding materials they need to go with it, hopefully not very much, depending on how it works. And you build a house. And that's what we're doing here on Earth, you know, building houses. And we talked about that in my last lab notes, how incredible they're looking now. But can you imagine when we see that first habitat go up built out of lunar dirt? It's going to be really cool. Excuse me. I claim this planet in the name of Mars. <gasps> now, most of us have probably heard of a company called Philips, and they're mainly known for electric razors and similar stuff like that. Well, they've launched a program called Philips Fixables. Say that three times fast. <laughs> Offering uh, 3D printable parts for their product repairs. Again, right to repair. Philips is one of the first that I know of that's doing things like this. There's a car, um, I think it's the Ford Maverick has some parts that Ford has put out for that. This program by Philips has started in the Czech Republic. Now, real quick, Czech Republic. What do we know about 3D printing there? Yes, Prusa. Prusa has joined together with them to help them put together this program. The first part they've come out with is a three millimeter comb for electric shavers, and they're saying there's a lot more to come. There's gonna be links in the description to that part, but you can look it up on printables and check that out. And their goal, again, just like everything else, is to support sustainability, to help people repair their own products instead of having to replace them. So the idea, don't throw it away, leave it in landfill for thousands of years, Let's replace the part that broke, and then the major portion of it that still works, we just continue to use it. Now, users can request missing parts, and Philips will notify them if the parts get added to their replacement program. Now, like I said, there's only one part currently available, but I'm interested to see if they're going to allow other makers to provide parts and, of course, test them out in-house. But wouldn't that be cool to be able to say, hey, I made that part and everybody around the world is using it on Philips through their program. That would be cool. So, hey, 
Prussian, Phillips, look into that. Um, but it could mean a lot new parts being made. And I could also see other companies seeing how this worked. You know, they always let somebody jump out there and be the guinea pig, see how it's going to work. So I could see a lot of other companies jumping on board eventually. And that's going to be really cool for all of us, especially in 3D printing at home. It's just one more step closer to having a 3D printer be that toaster-like item that we've talked about before, you know, having on our shelf. So I'm looking forward to see what happens with that. And hey, other businesses hopefully will jump on board. Well, that's it for today. Have fun, keep 3D printing, and let's all continue to learn, create, and amaze.